Right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the John Lewis Good Trouble panel. Before I begin, I want to mention a quick disclaimer. All comments of the moderators and guests of our program represent the thoughts of each individual and do not represent an official position of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Our moderator for this evening has been a professor at, of law at Georgia State University College of Law for 17 years. She teaches civil procedure, family law, education law, and race and law at Georgia, Georgia State College of Law. She has taught for as an adjunct professor at Howard Law School and the David A. Clark Law School at the University of the District of Columbia. She has also taught a comparative law, comparative law classes on race, affirmative action, and domestic violence in study abroad programs in Brazil, Austria, and China. Her research, scholarship, and teaching focused on issues related to educational equity, domestic violence, racial injustice, and equity, inclusion, and diversity, marriage equality, gender equity, and children's constitutional rights. Her articles and op-eds have been published in law journals and periodicals across the nation. And Supreme Court Justice Kennedy cited her for a co-authored amicus brief in his majority opinion in the landmark marriage equality decision over, over Jafel versus Hodges. Her record of ex exemplary scholarship and teaching earned her the Georgia State University Alumni Distinguishing Award in 2015 and her efforts and expand her efforts to expand and deepen the pipeline of students of color entering law school earned her recognition in 2013 as one of the 50 minority law professors under 50 making an impact in the legal in legal education. And lastly, in 2016 and 2017, she served as director of the John Lewis Fellowship Program, a humanity in action program funded by a grant to the National Center for Civil and Human Rights from the Melton Foundation, which afforded young people from across the nation a curated experience with the living history of civil and human rights. Friends, please join me in welcoming Professor Tanya Washington Hicks. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's so wonderful to be here um, to moderate what I know is going to be an exciting and informative and insightful panel. Um, I am pleased to moderate this discussion between Ben Arnon, who is co-founder and CEO of Color Farm Media. And this film is brought to us by this amazing organization. Um, that chronicles the life and legacy of John Lewis. And I look forward to hearing a lot about what the experience of making uh, this film about this legendary American was like. And we're also joined by Wanda Mosley, who is the senior coordinator, um, senior coordinator for Georgia of Black Voters Matter. Um, she, prior to working with BVM, she worked as the community outreach and volunteer manager at the New Georgia Project. And in 2018, she was selected to be a part of the inaugural cohort of fellows for the Movement for Black Lives Electoral Justice League. And I'm looking forward to hearing from her about what lessons um, we can learn from this amazing life that are particularly relevant now as we head toward a November election of unprecedented import. So welcome to both of you. And um, Ben, can I start with you about this making of the making of this amazing film? Um, what was it like? Yeah, well, thank you so much. It's um, great to be on this panel uh, with both of you. And uh, the film, the making of the film was was really uh, remarkable. We got started and the middle of 2018, um, my co-founder at Color Farm, uh, Erica Alexander, uh, had been a surrogate for Hillary Clinton since 2007. And along the way, she had actually campaigned with uh, Congressman Lewis. And also uh, it was the, the, in the same, at the same time was Congressman Lewis, uh, Erica and Stacey Abrams and Ayanna mm -hmm. Presley. So Erica always remarks that that was, um, you know, just an incredible experience. And so we, we, we had the opportunity to get involved with the film and we joined forces with Don Porter, who's the director and a producing partner and with Laura Michael Chisholm. And um, it was really remarkable because right away we had to sort of get out into the field and start filming because 
uh, there were things happening that were not going to wait mm -hmm. for for our film. Things like campaigning for the 2018 midterm election. So, uh, you know, we um, got a real quick sense for uh, you know it, for for the fact that it's hard to it was hard to keep up with Congressman Lewis. He was on the go. He was out there campaigning for uh, Stacey Abrams and um, folks in in Texas like Beto O'Rourke mm -hmm. and Lizzie Fletcher mm -hmm. and. Um, just all over the place. And so it was really an, an incredible experience. Um, we also had the opportunity, uh, as we saw from the film, to uh, interact with his family quite a bit and to film uh, in Alabama and also uh, in DC and Atlanta. And um, yeah, looking forward to sharing some more so, some more stories as we go along. But um, overall, it was it was really um, a remarkable experience and in, in sort of, you know, understanding, um, you know, a, a, a little bit a, a little bit better than I had before. Um, just, just, just how intensely passionate Congressman Lewis was about uh, his fight for uh, equality and uh, voting rights for all and uh, and equal justice. Yes, and one of the things that I found so impressive about the film is that you really captured. Um, Congressman Lewis's life from a number of different perspectives, from the intensely personal um, with, with um, reference to his wonderful relationship with his wife and her passing, to his childhood experiences, to his pro the protests he staged at, you know, on the floor of Congress. Um, you had lots of access to behind the scene moments. I mean, that must have been wonderful. It also must have been incredibly intense because you all were there in a lot of different spaces. Most definitely. Uh, I think that the, the access was phenomenal. We, we owe a lot of that to um, the folks in his office, especially Rachelle O'Neill, who uh, worked with the congressman for almost 20 years um, uh, in, in Atlanta. And yeah, being able to film, um, you know, his his house, we, you know, I think I think viewers of the film get, a, get an opportunity to really see how uh, deeply involved in the art world he was and how much art meant to him. Uh, having the opportunity to, to, to film with his uh, family, you know, you got an opportunity to see uh, how close he was to his family, how much they meant to him. I really believe that it was actually when he talks about the beloved community, I think that all started with, uh, you know, his, his roots of growing up um, in Alabama, in Troy, mm -hmm. Alabama, and uh, just what he learned from from his family. Um, and then, of course, you know, it's always it's always a lot of fun to be able to have a lav mic on someone when you're when you're trailing them with yeah, a, with a camera because because yeah. you you can actually learn later some of the some of the comments or some of the some of the things that were that were said that you may not have been able to hear so some of the jokes you know his humor yeah. always shines through some of the jokes between congressman lewis and his chief of staff michael collins or yeah. or or other <laughs> folks that um that we wouldn't have heard if it weren't for that lav mic being right there and so that that yes. was always a lot of fun as well the one that i remember um most vividly was when they were joking about or contrasting being dipped in the river and baptized right. versus being sprinkled. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. So Wanda, um, we're in a particular moment. We're preparing for an election that is going to be unprecedented in in its in in his in the history of our democracy. One, because we're living through a global deadly pandemic. Um, two, because we're having challenges inspired by that pandemic that are being responded to in ways that are frustrating people's ability to vote. And we seem to be at a critical moment at a crossroads where we are ha having to select between two very different visions of America and where and how we move forward. And so the centrality of uh, John Lewis's life and legacy to the moment that we're in is evident. What should we take from his life? What should we take from the way he lived his life and the way he fought his battles, um, particularly as they pertain to voting rights? What should we draw from those experiences in meeting the current moment? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here in the space with you, hearing your bio and all the great work that you've done is amazing. And then, of course, my buddy Ben, who had, along with his partner, who he always shouts out, had the vision to bring us this wonderful documentary mm -hmm. about, you know, the congressman who is amazing and beloved by so many. 
Um, so, you know, the main thing I would say in terms of takeaways from just looking at his life would be never settle. Do not settle for the status quo. Always fight for what you believe in and always be willing to continue that fight and knowing that these fights are marathons and not sprints. They are continuous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been pointed out to me several times over the past couple of months, especially that in a lot of ways we are still fighting many of the battles that Congressman Lewis and his cohorts uh, waged back in the 60s. Um, and while in some instances that there is truth to that, but we're also reminded that we've made great strides since then and mm -hmm. we have to take the wins and celebrate them as they come. Um, but knowing that, you know, look, for Black people in America, our right to vote has always been under attack. We have just commemorated the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. And you know we're still fighting to protect that sacred right. Um, so if we look at someone like Congressman Lewis who dedicated his entire life to that fight, then we can all keep fighting. We can all get mm -hmm. up the next day, put on our shoes, put on our hats, our sneakers, and go out and continue our fight, whatever that looks like. If you're someone who plans uh, days of action, if you're someone who plans canvassing events, phone banking events, if you stand on the, on the corner on election day, waving a sign at a busy intersection, reminding people to vote, then that is your contribution to the struggle. We appreciate it. And knowing that it is going to take all of us contributing whatever it is we have to offer to get through this fight, because it is ongoing and it is still the war still waging. We're still in it. Yes. And it, you know, it struck me um, when, when I was watching the movie, how very young he was when he started, um, you know, fighting for justice for others. And I think a lot of people associate um, older folks with the movement. Um, but the reality is it was the youth that yes. were out there pushing the envelope. It was little black yes. school children integrating schools yes. after Brown was decided. Yes. It was, you know, young people in college getting on those buses and driving down into the South, risking their own lives. And I see that reflected in the Black Lives Matter protests that we see now. Young people, it's not that they don't know there's a pandemic. It's that they're willing to risk their health to make the point that this democracy needs to work for everyone. So what else can we say to young folks about voting? Because they will decide the election. They will decide who the yeah, so there are, yeah, so there are a lot of things to be said when we're thinking about and talking uh, to young people. You know, I found it interesting um, in certain spaces uh, during the initial uprisings, um, a lot of comments and things that people said about the young people taking to the streets in the midst of a pandemic. Um, but to your point, it just reminds us that it's a different risk, but a risk of life and limb nonetheless mm -hmm. that they are willing to make for the betterment of all of us, right? And then I think also, I found the criticisms of the young people to be frustrating on so many levels, because as you pointed out, the actual movement, the work in the streets is always done by young people. Us older folks are in the background looking at policy and all this other <laughs> stuff. And so with that, we have a certain responsibility to help connect dots for the young people so that their work matches up with the work that we're doing and then combine together. That's when we're going to start the real change and start building power. You know, and I was always quick to remind folks on social media, look, you're, you're criticizing, and you have bad things to say about these young people, but we're going to need them in November to get to that ballot box. So, Absolutely. so watch what you say. If you burn bridges with them now, don't come back around later in October and November when you need them because they're not going to listen to you because they exactly. are not going to hear you. They are going to remember those criticisms that you heaped on them yes. for the work that they were doing that eventually we are all going to benefit from. And those yeah. were important observations the people that you were sharing those observations with, did they listen? Did they, did they reach so. out? Did they mend those fences so that, so that young people will, will feel inspired to participate in this, this upcoming election? I, I sure hope so. I mean, that was the message that I sent. You know, most of these are obviously folks who don't necessarily work in movement spaces or social mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. or voting rights. Um, but even within their own circle of influence, with their, within their own family members, you got little cousins, nieces, or nephews, embrace them. 
help give them the PPE, help them get masks, yeah. talk yeah. to them about what's going on, and then making sure they then carry that information to their peers so that they understand that what you're doing there combined with what the power that we have at the ballot box, that's when we start seeing the wins. That's when yeah. we start seeing the power. And, and to, to that point, Ben, there was a scene in the movie where um, Congressman Lewis was sitting with two of his young friends and one of them had just received a letter from his mother who seemed to be offering some of the criticism like Wanda has shared with us. Like, what are you doing? We didn't send you to college to, to free the world. We sent you to college to get an education. And for many of these students, they were the first in their families to earn an education. What do you think the film has to say to adults who don't necessarily understand or appreciate the necessity of young people at this moment in this movement. Yeah, I mean, hope, hopefully it opened their eyes to, as you just point out, the necessity of, you know, of young people in this moment. And hopefully it, it also helps to, um, to, to, to tie that connection together that Wanda was alluding to, the fact that everything that's happening in the streets, that's always happened in the streets with protest movements, with marches, all of that is directly linked to voting and, 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 and they need to take place together and the folks that are leading on both sides of those need to recognize that and and um, ideally you know be, be working together towards the you know to, towards a common goal but yeah ho hopefully um, the film helped to, um, to 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 make that connection clear for for uh, you know people who might um, you know have those uh, perceptions and and hopefully it also just helped um, everyone to, to maybe t step back and and gain new perspective on um, uh, and also the, the bridge between, one of the things that was really important for, particularly for Dawn, the director, was to, to, to show the bridge between all the work that John Lewis did uh, yeah. in his early days, you know, in, in Nashville, in Alabama, uh, and the bridge that connected all that work to the work that he was still doing right up to his death in Congress. Um, and alongside people who were, you know, outside of Congress working on, on activism. During, you know, his, his um, later years, he really recognized that uh, it was important for him to create a connection, a strong connection uh, with the youth. He did that through publishing, through writing his graphic novel and going to uh, Comic-Con and leading, you mm -hmm. know, a march around Comic-Con with young people. He did that through, you know, he was constantly inspired by um, the Parkland students, by mm -hmm. everything that was happening uh, over the last few months, the Black Lives Matter movement and all the uprisings. He was so inspired by that that he went to Black Lives Matter Plaza because he needed yes. to he needed to feel that in his soul. He needed to to see it and 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 feel it, even though he knew and he wrote this in the op-ed that was published the day of his funeral. Um, he knew that physically he wasn't really in good enough shape to go, and the reality was that the next day he ended up in the hospital with an infection, and that was sort of the beginning of the end in terms of his his health. But but he knew he had to be there because that was also. Um, I think symbolically and spiritually for him, a yes. connection between a bridge to, to a younger generation. Yes, and the way that you all achieved that, um, that connection or the creation of that bridge was interesting because the film wasn't just chronological. It wasn't like he was born in Troy at this time in American history and then he did this and then he did that. There was, you know, you jumped back and forth and mm -hmm. so you, we could see all of these connections between now and then. And then you right. go back to you know present day and then you return to some period in his youth and you showed him footage that he yeah. hadn't seen before. And we got to see him watching this for the first time. Yeah, that was one of the most special um, you know, aspects of, of the filmmaking. And, and that was really all um, you know, fr from the brain of, of Dawn Porter. I'll tell you how that came about. In March of last year, 2019, we accompanied Congressman Lewis and his congressional delegation on their annual pilgrimage to, uh, to Alabama, to Birmingham, mm -hmm. uh, Montgomery, and Selma. And in Montgomery, we went to the EJI Museum. That was actually Congressman mm -hmm. Lewis's first time being there. Oh, and man. while we were there, um, there was, you know, the, the museum was open, so there were other people there mm -hmm. as well. And there was there was this 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 uh, I think a high school student maybe junior high school um, guy who was standing next to Congressman Lewis looking at some archival footage 
of the civil rights movement and, and literally Congressman Lewis was in it and, Cong and, and, and Dawn was sort of right in back of them and she overheard Congressman Lewis watching the footage and say to this, to this young man, I can't believe that's me. Look how young I was. I can't believe that that's me. And so she got the idea to actually show him on these really big screens. So we actually filmed that um, interview uh, several months later in Washington, D.C. at the arena stages. And we had it set up where there were three big screens all around him. And, yeah. um, and what was really amazing was at one point, uh, Congressman Lewis started to talk back to to dawn and started to say things. Some of that's in the films. He starts to say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these recollections like that, that guy in that picture was, was my seatmate on the bus. And that was my, yes. and, and then it started to pull stuff out of him. And, and, and honestly, that was such a big breakthrough because one thing about Congressman Lewis, I, and th they joke about it in the film, you know, the, the, the chicken story, like at, yes. at the staff <laughs> reunion, all of the staff had heard it a ton of times. He, he was on message. Like it was, it was yes. difficult to actually get him off message. So, so I thought dawn was really creative because she was able yeah. to sort of um, break down, uh, you know, his, his guard a little bit and, and, and right. really get him to, to, to share. That was, that was amazing. Um, just to hear him remarking and, and really you could see in his face that he was remembering yeah. being there in those spaces. Um, Wanda, one of the things that the film also highlighted, and this may have been done in one of the um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This may have been in one run in one of the uh, shots of the film where Congressman Lewis was talking about um, the intersectionality of the movement, which was really progressive for the time, you know, the civil rights movement of his day. Um, you know, most people thought about women's rights and black people's rights and indigenous rights as siloed and unconnected. Um, but he understood that equality is not divisible, like either it exists for all or it doesn't exist at all. And I think that what, what I've seen of the footage of the um, current protests is a lot of intersectionality, a lot of different people all coming together to protest and resist injustice. Um, and the people of different races, just different ethnic backgrounds, different sexual orientations, genders, age, it's really phenomenal to see that. And Wanda, do you think that has something to say about our, the current moment that we're in, that there's an existential threat to everyone? Um, and it's manifesting in the killing of black men um, and women, but it is touching people beyond that specific demographic. Yeah, so I, you know, to your point, Congressman Lewis was so progressive, you know, beyond mm -hmm. his time and his thinking um, and the way that he moved about, you know, doing the work and bringing everyone in. Um, it's just absolutely amazing. And, I, and I, you know, Ben mm -hmm. touched on earlier his connection to the, the students of Parkland. I always thought that was so amazing for him to make time and to be in spaces with him uh, for, for them and for them to be inspired by him because he was, you know, their age. Absolutely. Uh, when he started a lot of his work in the civil rights movement. So mm -hmm. um, that connection, that passing of the baton, if you will, I think is super important. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious to see what these kids do later on in life and if they reference back to some of the time uh, that they spent with him. Um, but yeah. yeah, but to your point, I, you know, I don't, it, it's interesting, Dr. Washington, because we're, we're just in this, you know, surreal sort of time frame with all the things that are happening in the world um, and then in our country. And when you just overlay them, it just, I think we're at a point where it took almost a pandemic to slow people down so that they could hear and see not anything new, nothing right. new, nothing new. We have had so many recordings of senseless murders of black people in this country. Um, you know, going back to, I believe her name was Latasha Harlan around mm -hmm. the time of the Rodney King beating mm -hmm. uh, back in the nineties, there is video of the store owner shooting this girl in the head over yeah. like a 55 cent drink or something like that. Yeah. So none of this is new, but 
it, again, this pandemic has really changed everything. It slowed everybody down, I believe, and made people be still for a moment and just sit with this and yeah. reckon with this and really yes. understand and take this in, all these things that are happening. And a lot of people, a lot of great allies have come to the forefront and they mm -hmm. too, I believe, are genuinely frustrated. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I might add, there's probably a lot of guilt because again, they've seen videos before, mm -hmm. but they weren't moved to act. Um, they were, you know, going about their regular everyday lives, you know, mm -hmm. but now you hear a lot of people, especially um, older folks who are involved in the movement say this time it feels different. This, mm -hmm. this era, this movement, these uprisings are different. And so, mm -hmm. yes, we have come to a time where this intersectionality has brought so many people to the forefront. You see in many spaces, as many non-Black people in the streets marching, um, they're willing to put themselves on the front lines as well. And so, you know, with that, we have now put together this really diverse, beautiful movement of so many different people from so many walks of life and so many corners of our country mm -hmm. um, and of our state that, you know, this is where we're really, I believe, starting to see progress. And we're going mm -hmm. to start to see pushes for policy changes in addition to taking to the streets, in addition to showing our power at the ballot box, but starting to demand changes with regards to policy and how we are governed and those decisions that affect our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And what would you say, Wanda, um, is one thing that everyone on this live stream could do to honor um, Congre Congressman Lewis's legacy so that's question one. And question two is how do we connect to younger people who may feel, and older people who may feel disconnected from the history and don't necessarily believe that their vote will matter or count or change some of the realities that need to be changed? Yeah, so one thing that everybody who is listening, viewing this discussion can do is it involve yourself and it will do take what we call it Black Voters Matter, the five friends and family pledge, where you are pledging to reach out to five people in your circle of influence, make sure they are registered to vote, mm -hmm. make sure they understand their options for voting, whether it's vote by mail, vote in person early or vote on election day, show them how to find the information that they need to become an informed voter and make certain they get out there and they actually vote. I think that sometimes we underestimate the influence that we have within our own circles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look, I, I'm an activist and obviously I work in movement spaces, so I understand my power. But I think folks believe if they don't work in the movement or don't do that kind of work, they can't have that influence. And that's simply not true. Mm -hmm. So again, take that five friends and family pledge, commit to empowering people in your circle to make sure that they have the information that they need to go out and vote in this upcoming election. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of your other question, you know, it, it's like I said before, it's, sometimes it can be difficult to organize young people, especially if you've been one of those persons who has not always, um, you know, been a supporter of theirs. They remember that, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the most important thing that we can do as organizers, and, and we can all be organizers, whether you're a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a filmmaker, an activist, whatever, a banker, we all yeah. have organizing abilities within us. And the first and most important thing that we should do is listen. Yeah. Have conversations with folks, allow them to express what it is that concerns them, what is important to them. And as you mm -hmm. are listening and hearing, help connect the dots to what they right. are telling you with elections, voting, mm -hmm. elected officials, and seats of power, mm -hmm. and help them understand how everything is connected. Nothing happens, you know, accidentally. It's all a part of the system of civic engagement, which is a big broad term um, mm -hmm. that we throw around. But if we really start to break that down into sort of, you know, these digestible chunks of things that make sense, then help them understand that. So if they're interested in the de defund the police movement, help them understand who sets budgets for that. Is it your right. city council? Is it your mayor? Is it your county commissioner if you live in outside of a metro area? Um, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're concerned about utility shutoffs, 
then start thinking about your public service commission and seats like that and understanding you know, the, the structure of, of utilities and those types of services. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, I think there's a hunger and there's a curiosity, but talking down to people is the fastest way to turn them off. But listening, hearing, and offering something that they can understand and they can use, that's how we're gonna expand the electorate and bring more people in. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for that answer, Wanda. I wanna remind people who are watching to um, put questions in the comment section. So if you have questions, we will draw from those as we turn to the uh, Q&A section in just a moment. Um, I just wanna ask um, one more question of Ben before we turn to Q&A. Was, was one of the goals of the film to actually speak to young people? Um, because I watched it and I was like trying to think if I'm in junior high or high school or college, this would really help me to understand how someone like John Lewis becomes a John Lewis, right? You get to right. see all the different parts of his life and how he grew into this amazing person, having lived through some amazing experiences and feeling like I, that could be me as well. That could be any yeah. one of us who decides to stand up and, and take a stand and devote our lives to that. Was that in you all's yeah, mind as you made the film? Because that came through so most clear. Definitely. Yeah, m most definitely. Um, I think the film is intended for everyone, of course, but but we definitely wanted to um, help young people who uh, may have heard of John Lewis, but didn't really know much about his story or may not even be familiar with him at all, or may know a lot about him, but, but there was still more for them to learn. Um, help them see a few things. Number one, John Lewis, for us, it was really important that, that uh, we make this film because uh, in, in media, especially in film and TV over the years, John Lewis has essentially been sort of a side character. He's kind of been like Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis or so-and-so and John Lewis. And we thought mm -hmm. it was time for him to really be front and center, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, I, we thought that it was important to show that, you know, Wanda brought up the term earlier that that, that is a marathon and that, um, you know, that, that someone like a John Lewis, um, you know, it's one, it's one thing to, to be all in for a cause for a few months or maybe for a few years, but how do you sustain that for your entire life? In the case of John Lewis for, you know, 60 plus years, um, mm -hmm. you know, and even more than that, you know, since he was a little kid, but, but um, you know, r really, um, you know, that was, that was definitely one of the things that we wanted to, um, to, to, to get across. And then also it was very important to all of us, especially Dawn, that, um, that, that we show John Lewis as the strategist that he was. Because a lot of times yeah. when people hear about the civil rights movement and the civil rights leaders, they, they think of them as brave. They talk about them as courageous. Yeah. And yes, that's definitely the truth. And John Lewis was as brave as anyone who's ever existed, but he was also very strategic and very smart. And that was the case when he was organizing and marching all the way through everything he was doing in, um, in Congress. And um, yeah. you know, just one other thing to, to answer the previous question that, that you asked of, of Wanda, um, there are so many great resources out there for people that, that want to get involved and there. There are so many ways um, to, in, in today's day and age, even with COVID, there's so many things that you could do just from home, whether it's um, tapping mm -hmm. into a great organization like Black, Black Voters Matter or so many other organizations where you can, where, where they can get you phone banking, they can get you text mm -hmm. banking. Um, mm -hmm. There's also, you know, Participant Media uh, is, is one of the distributors for this film. And they uh, created a fantastic social impact campaign with a really um, incredible educational resource uh, and just overall um, resource. It's makegoodtrouble.com. So that's mm -hmm. a great resource for anyone to visit. They can learn about the history of voting rights and voter suppression. There are all kinds of ways that they can take action. Um, so that's, that's another great resource there, makegoodtrouble.com. Great, thank you for sharing that. And your film also highlighted some of our really um, young politicians, right? That mm -hmm. um, Congressman Lewis helped to get elected. I love to see those, those interviews with those young women. Um, I really like the interview that you all did where you asked him about how he came to move, transition from activist to politician, right? Yeah. And what that was like, because that's the real, you know, people grow into different spaces in life. And hearing him talk about why he made that transition, I thought was really new information 
that was being mm -hmm. shared with the public that really wouldn't otherwise have access to that part of his life. Most definitely. Um, you know, on, on another uh, uh, conversation that I was involved with, someone talked about sort of activism as an outsider and as an insider, mm -hmm. you know, inside and outside of, of the halls of Congress. And they talked about um, John Lewis that, you know, obviously he started off as an outsider. He certainly became an insider. He was in Congress for 33 years, but he always kept that outsider mentality and he always kept mm -hmm. a bridge to, uh, to, the, to the activists that were doing the work on the street and, and you know, on the, you know, out in the field. And, um, and I think that we saw some of that with this um, new class of Congress people that came yeah. in in 2018. Um, there was definitely, uh, you know, there was a blue wave, there was a, um, there was a female wave, there was, a, there was an activist wave. There was a lot of people who came mm -hmm. in who had been doing a lot of community organizing. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, just to think back to 2008 when Barack Obama came on the scene and, and you know, everyone started to kind of hear the term community community organizer. And um, there was a lot of, of putting that down that term. I think it was mm -hmm. Sarah Palin who maybe yes. you know, famously <laughs> um, tried to put it down. Um, and the reality is that um, community organizing is, is the uh, most powerful, um, you know, type, type of way that I think someone can can um, you know explore their activism and and to Wanda's point, everyone has the potential to be Absolutely. an organizer. Everyone is an organizer already, and so um, you know what we started to see over I think that period from from particularly from 2008 when when Barack Obama was running as a community organizer to uh, to 2018 was um, a bunch of community organizers who had sort of grown up uh, you know come of age in that time frame and now yeah. we're running for office as very proud community organizers. And so when they get into Congress, they still maintain that community organizer yeah. mentality and that's really powerful. Right, they maintain the mentality and they also maintain what you spoke about, Ben, the skill set, right? right. The, skill, the strategic skill set of negotiating change, of repackaging demands, right. of bringing people together, of collaborative, intentional conduct, which, you highlighted when you highlighted all of the legislation that he co-sponsored over his years that he sponsored and co-sponsored over his years as a legislator. I mean, he took that organizing skill set and brought it into um, his work yeah. as a congressman. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. That was very important also to to the whole filmmaking team, especially to Don. That you know, Don Lewis was a remarkably talented legislator and actually mm -hmm. got a lot of um, important laws passed. And, 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 and he's never really talked of that way. And so that montage Thank that she put together was really to highlight that and really to, um, to, to, to make sure that people were aware of the strategist that was John Lewis. Mm -hmm. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have, we have a couple of audience questions coming in. Um, one person is asking, what's a good starting point um, for those who don't identify as activists, but who want to get involved in the movement and create positive change. I'll start and then hand it to you, Wanda. Um, I'd say a good starting point is just to, to, to pick one or multiple um, groups that are already doing this, whether it's Black Voters Matter, whether it's um, um, you know Fair Fight, When We All Vote, there's a mm -hmm. ton of great organizations out there supporting um, you know, one of the campaigns and just get involved and uh, just start making phone calls um, you know, it's, it's so easy nowadays. You can, you can get a, a phone banking list just online and, and start making phone calls. And, and it might not feel like there's anything special about doing that, but actually it, it, it makes a big difference. And then, you know, they talk, we sometimes talk about the ladder of engagement and kind of over time, you could kind of walk up that ladder of engagement. And, um, you know, the, the, the easiest thing to do is, is or, or one of the one of the starting points also could be what Wanda talked about before is just, you know, you know, talking to five friends, making sure they're registered and all mm -hmm. those kinds of things, and then get yourself involved and then start to get them involved in doing phone banking or some other activity and um, mm -hmm. and then let it grow and expand from there. Wanda, yeah. would you yeah. like to add something? Yeah, no, that's great, Ben. Are you sure you're not a community organizer? Because that was like I, the perfect I, answer. I, I am a, I'm a, I'm a proud community organizer. <laughs> yes, I, we can tell by that answer. You definitely were. Yeah, no, I mean, what Ben said is spot on. Find organizations who are already doing the work. Plug in with them. I mean, look, I've got, you know, a couple 
300,000 maybe phone calls to make across the state. So, you know, we might- You could use some help. You could yeah, use some help. Yeah, we've got a bunch of 500,000 text messages that we're gonna send. Yeah, we might need a little help. Um, but then, like Ben said, there are lots of organizations who are out there on the ground engaging um, and talking to people. And, and look, you know, sometimes I, I feel like we take for granted that everyone is informed, that everyone knows about the election and voting and the whole process. And that could not be further from the truth. I think it's important for us to remember that in particular here in Georgia, in certain industries, our minimum wage is still only $5.15 an hour. So, you know, there are folks who literally just don't have time in the day to research whether or not the place that they voted last year or two years ago is still open. Maybe right. they didn't go through the mail after they worked their third straight shift and they were tired and they missed that letter that said, we moved your polling precinct. Right. Um, and maybe they're confused about some of the things that are on the ballot. So those text messages, those phone calls, um, all of that for a lot of folks is the touch they need, the reminder they need, the information that they need. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's gonna take all of us, but I think that you know it's important for us to remember that not everybody is where we all are. It doesn't mean they don't care. It doesn't mean they don't want to vote. You know, I feel like we make too much uh, talk about voter apathy in this in this country, in particular mm -hmm. in this state, and that is just not true. There is a voter suppression is real. There are people who are actively placing barriers in front of certain people to keep them home. And again, overlay that with our minimum wage, with all the problems and issues that we have at the polling precincts, and now a pandemic. Well, it's tough for some people. Mm -hmm. But that one touch, that one text message might be the thing, the little bit of information that that person needs to get them mm -hmm. out, to give them a chance to have their voices heard. So to your point, I'll someone else mention. is asking. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. I was going to mention one one other um, resource. You know, I mentioned makegoodtrouble.com before. So on that website, there's actually, um, you know, th that's part of the Good Trouble campaign, which is this holistic campaign around the film, around voting rights and learning about voter suppression. But there's a handbook on there. It's really, it's really phenomenal. And um, so people can also access that through makegoodtrouble.com. It's, um, they can learn, you know, how to stay informed. They can learn how to take action. Um, they can make sure that, that, um, they understand how to get themselves registered and get other people registered to vote. So that's also a good resource there as well. Mm -hmm. And on the voting point, um, I think this is a really good question from the audience. What should we include in our voting day plans? I know that I've seen a lot of um, public service messages about plan your vote. Um, mm -hmm. And so aside from you know, bottled water and a chair, because you're going to be sitting for a while, what else should we include in our voting day plans that will make the experience easier and inspire people to actually participate because they feel like they have some control over what the experience will entail. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the first things we have to do is stop thinking about voting as a one day thing. Right. Early voting starts a few weeks before Election Day. Mm -hmm. We also has a, have as an option because of the pandemic vote by mail. So applying for that absentee ballot. So so, you know, when you say plan your vote, have a plan A, then have a plan <laughs> B and then have a plan C. So make sure that you are educated on, on all facets of how you are going to vote this year. If you apply for the absentee ballot know what to do if you never receive it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Understand how to return it. Understand that if, you know, cause I mean, look, <laughs> I was in America's a few weeks ago. There are actually some neighborhoods where the blue uh, US post office mailboxes have been removed from certain mm -hmm. neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. understand what to do if that mailbox suddenly isn't there. Know that there are drop boxes mm -hmm. in the area that do not require a stamp and then if for whatever reason you're not able to return that ballot or you don't get it, then understand your options for early voting. Know the different locations, pick a good time. And then if for whatever reason you're not able to do early voting, then your plan C would be on election day, going to your assigned polling precinct mm -hmm. and making sure you know where that is. And then also if you apply for a vote by mail ballot and you didn't receive it, understand your right when you arrive at the precinct is to at the very least be offered a provisional ballot if for some reason there's a glitch in the computer system that says 
or if there's a coworker, God bless them, who has not received the proper training, and they say to you, well, you apply for a ballot. The computer said you got, you got a ballot at your house. Explain to them, I did not get it, or I did not receive it. You know, be, be firm in your conviction and understand what your rights and your options are, and make sure you stick to that, and you advocate for yourself on site if necessary. So making a plan and being educated. And both of you have provided some resources. I just want to make sure we repeat those for the people who are listening. Places where people can go to get additional information about the voting process beyond just the one day that you talked about, um, Wanda. And also the, um, the processes and procedures that they need to be aware of, what rights they're entitled to, so that if a poll worker who hasn't been properly trained is not according them their rights, they know what to ask for. If there are, um, if you all could repeat the, um, the websites that you all have provided so people will know where they can go to get that information. Yeah, the, the one that I mentioned was makegoodtrouble.com. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure Wanda, you have some others. By the way, Wanda, is there also, isn't there like a voter protection, like 800 number that if people, if people have, if people have an issue at the, at the polls, they can call and, and they'll get a voter protection attorney on the phone? Yes, absolutely. 866 our vote. 866 O U R V O T E. That is the phone number to call the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. They man that hotline during voting periods and they can help you. They will um, explain. Um, what your options are, what procedures to follow, and what to do if you have trouble when you go to vote mm -hmm. in person, whether it's early voting or in person on election mm -hmm. day, 866 our vote. And then if you visit our website, there's information there about applying for the absentee ballot, the procedures to return that. Um, vote.org is another resource um, that is uh, providing information for folks in terms of making sure that they're registered and that they know and understand on um, all the different options that they have on election day. And again, you know, it's about advocating for yourself and being empowered and understanding what your rights are and saying, you know, look, we, you, if you go into this with the mindset, like you said, Dr. Dr. Washington, bring your chair, bring some snacks, bring your patience, have your phone fully charged. You can play all your yes. little video games. You can be on Facebook. Um, you can do a Facebook Live and inspire other people to come. You know, one Absolutely. of the other things that we are working on with a bunch of other organizations um, in the metro area, as well as the rural areas in South and Southwest Georgia, where we do most of our work, are poll parties, parties at the polls, music, food, DJs, just making sure that people know that they are not alone, people care. Um, we will have pizza, we will have sandwiches. You know, there have been instances in, in certain communities where folks will bring out a grill and they start cooking hot dogs and hamburgers and chicken because we go make sure folks get fed and they have the strength to make sure that they stay in that line. And, and also know if you are in line by closing time, you will be allowed to vote no matter what. Polls close at seven. Oftentimes, the last couple of election cycles, we've seen a lot of precincts have to extend time because of issues with machines and opening late, et cetera. But 7 p.m. is the closing time for precincts in Georgia. And as long as you are in line by that time, you will be allowed to vote. There will be legal observers on hand. There will be advocates on hand. And I promise you, if they try to take you out of the line, somebody will remind them they cannot do that. Exactly. And Wanda, repeat your website for our Black Voters Matter? Black Voters Matter Fund, F-U-N-D dot O-R-G. O-R-G, great. So we have 10 minutes left in this program. I guess time flies when you're having fun and, and giving good information and inspiring good trouble. Um, I, I have one closing question for each of you. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Ben. What Obviously, you all took far more footage than you could include in a, in a two hour movie. So what else did you learn about John Lewis that you weren't able to include in the film? Uh, great question. Um, you know, I think that there was probably, uh, well, there, there, were, there were a few more scenes that were, that were shot um, of him in, in, like at his home and places like, mm -hmm. You know that that people don't see us often, and and so I think that um, 
you got a sense for how much of an art lover he was from the film, but there were some some uh, some footage that uh, didn't make it in the film that 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 you probably would have gotten even more of a sense. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I think that there there were uh, a bunch of of well, there was there was some footage that we had actually shot um, early on in the middle of 2018 uh, when when mm -hmm. Freedom Parkway in Atlanta was named after John yeah. Lewis. Yeah. And, um, and and that footage didn't end up making it into the film, unfortunately. But um, but that was a really special experience. I think that um, you know he. I, I think for for him seeing his name on that street yeah. sign, I think was really moving for him. Uh, and so that would have been that would have been nice to to have actually you know ca captured for the film as well. Yes, yes, that was a that was a wonderful event, and I just felt like. Yeah. We were celebrating him while he was here, not yeah. waiting until he was no longer here just to celebrate. We got his flowers and enjoyed right. the appreciation while he was here to experience it. Right. Um, Wanda, your final closing question. Um, and I think this is a really interesting question. There was a lot in the film about, um, there was a lot in the film about nonviolence right, as a philosophy, as an animating philosophy of his work. And so given his commitment to it for the entirety of his life, um, one viewer wants to know, how do we think John Lewis would address the Republican ideas and framings around violence in the cities by Black people who are out of control? And using that um, to inspire people to vote their fears rather than um, voting for a, a more inclusive vision of America. Yeah, I, I think he would have pushed back sternly on that. I think that he, his beliefs and his values were deeply entrenched in the nonviolent um, way of uh, exercising civil disobedience. Um, I think that he would have reminded us um, that violence is not going to be the answer. It's not going mm -hmm. to get us the things that we want and that we need. And I think that, you know, he would hearken back to his <clears throat> uh, belief and ideal in the beloved community. Um, you know, he, he led with love in what he did. He sacrificed his own body. Um, he shed blood for, for the ideas and the ideals that he believed in. Um, for this beloved community. So there's no way that he would not speak truth to power when it comes to those who want to incite violence mm -hmm. and then try to use that as you know, a further dividing point in this country. Uh, he, he just, he wouldn't stand for that. That goes against everything that he believed in. Um, and and he, would, he would caution us uh, to not let that further divide us and to, to remind mm -hmm. us that you know, even though our ideologies don't match, there's, there's still an opportunity for us to love and care for one another as part of that beloved community. Yes. Oh, thank you. That was, that was beautiful. So I now have to turn to four closing points that we want to make before we end the event. Um, reminders, um, and I think a lot of them echo what both Ben and Wanda have, have said about the upcoming election and the role that we um, should be prepared to play in preserving our democracy. Whoever you're voting for, you need to vote. Um, we wanna ensure that we're registered to vote. And these are things to Wanda's point that we need to do in advance, not the day of, and we need to help other people who may not have the luxury of time to research this information, to be clear about whether they're registered to vote, where they're supposed to vote, how they plan to vote so that this doesn't sneak up on them. And now is the time to start having those uh, preparation conversations. Number two is honoring the legacy of uh, Congressman Lewis um, by getting in good trouble and protecting the right to vote. Um, you know, democracy is not a spectator sport and it requires of us to show up and enforce it. And I'm really glad that Wanda talked about the importance of um, reporting voting irregularities as they're happening in real time, because a lot of organizations like um, Black Voters Matter are engaging um, lawyers, 
and poll watchers to catalog and document these irregularities. Uh, I think this is one uh, election that probably won't be decided the night of the, the general election, the, the night that people cast their votes on that day. It may be weeks later and it may involve litigation. And so all of these irregularities become part of the record. Um, so be prepared to, to report them if and when they occur. Three, volunteering to be a poll worker at a local precinct and we have the registration information there. I was a voter protection um, worker in South Georgia where my family is from in Waycross. And it makes a difference, you know, when people who are going to vote know that there's someone there that can provide them with information. And also being an ambassador for the campaign for equal dignity, contacting 10 friends and inviting them to join the campaign. I mean, this really is a ha all hands on deck moment. And it's wonderful to celebrate the history and life of John Lewis, but his legacy is a living legacy. And the best way for us to honor it is to actually act in the spirit in which he lived his life, which was one of activism and doing something to make sure that life is better for ourselves and for our communities. So I don't know if there are, are there closing remarks or am I making closing remarks? Um, I'll just say um, thank you so much. It was, it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed um, meeting you. I'm gonna go uh, look up all of your work online and I'm sure that, that uh, there'll be some reading that I get into. Uh, Wanda, it's always great to see you. And um, thanks so much, uh, you know, for supporting the film. Uh, remember, make good and uh, get into good trouble. And you know, this was uh, this was a great panel. Um, Wanda, I'll hand to you. Yeah, no, I want to echo the same sentiment, um, Ben. Dr. Washington, it was a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. You know, anytime I can be in a space with Ben and talk about the great work that he did and connected to, you know, what's going on now. Um, it's, you know, another opportunity for folks to be inspired, to be able to see and know the mm -hmm. history and understand the legacy and help them understand that the role that they can play in the present day, like you mentioned, Dr. Washington. So it was a pleasure meeting you. Ben, hey, keep getting in good trouble. I'm sure we'll you know, maybe do another one these soon. And, you know, yes. thanks to everybody that's out there watching. I, we do hope that you all are inspired and that you will um, get into some good trouble. Absolutely. And if you haven't seen the film, see the film. If you've already seen the film, watch it again. Watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> like with any movie, right? You're going to see things you missed the first time. Right. So yes, and, yeah, I've and seen it twice. It, it will inspire you. It will inspire you to vote. Like you yes. will be inspired to vote. So perfect timing to drop the film, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks for all the support. We appreciate it. Oh, it's well-deserved. Good night, everybody. That was good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. That was great.